In May 2002, when I was still in primary school, I took this photo at the newly opened Water Garden Station, where the electrification had just been extended from St Albans. While my focus here was obviously the preserved Tate train visiting this location for the first time, I incidentally captured half a view of this recently refurbished M train Comenge, specifically a car 394M. Nine months after this photo was taken, 394M, along with the rest of its set, would do something no Melbourne train had ever done before, making its way 16.8 kilometres from Broadmeadows to Spencer Street, with nobody on board. Crucially, not even a driver. This is the story of the Broadmeadows Runaway, probably the most thrilling runaway train in Victoria's long railway history. The contents of this video are based on the official report by the Australian Transport Safety Bureau, which is publicly available, and I'll put a link down below if you'd like to read it yourself. Monday the 3rd of February 2003 was a warm summer evening in Melbourne, 27 degrees Celsius with clear skies and a light breeze. It was about quarter past nine, the peak was well and truly over, and it would have been pretty quiet at Broadmeadows Station, which was then the terminus for suburban trains on what we now call the Craigieburn Line. It was early in the privatisation era, and this was M-Train territory. Back then, trains were routinely split up to run as three-car sets outside peak times, and this evening was no different. At 9.13pm, suburban train 5859, a three-car Comenge made up of cars 393M, 1048T and 394M, arrived at the terminus after an uneventful run from the city, coming to a stop in Platform 2 and detraining its passengers. Now the Broadmeadows line isn't just a suburban line, it's also used by country passenger and freight trains on the northeast main line. As our train arrived into the platform, the driver, a 37-year-old with 12 years driving experience, noticed that the platform display was showing a V-line train to Seymour as the next departure, and therefore expected he would have to shunt to a siding to allow that train through before returning to the platform to form the next train to the city. Now a Comenge is an electric multiple unit, an EMU, with a driver's cab at each end of the three-car set. When changing ends at a terminus, the controls need to be isolated in the leading cab and then cut in at the other end of the train to allow it to be driven in the other direction. As per normal procedure, the driver made a full application of the train brake and then isolated the controls, before stepping off onto the platform to clarify the situation about the Seymour train. He probably planned on speaking to the signaller directly, as the signal box is located on the platform. However, upon stepping off the train, he noticed the display had now changed to show a Flinders Street service, which would be his train returning to the city, so there would be no need to shunt out the way. Given there was now no reason to stop passengers boarding, he re-entered the cab in order to enter the new train number, 5264 which would set the destination boards and internal passenger information system to display the correct information for the return to the city. The process for entering the train number required briefly cutting the cab back in again, entering the number, then reapplying the train brake before isolating the controls once more. This process of entering the train number to set the destination was relatively new, having only been introduced when the first of these trains were refurbished about a year earlier. Comenge trains are also fitted with a park brake, however it was policy at the time not to bother applying it if you were just stepping off the train to change ends. So our driver left the cab for a second time, but rather than heading straight to the other end of the train, took a quick detour into the station building to use the loo. Now, I won't claim to be an expert on air braking, and the report wasn't 100% conclusive about exactly what happened here, but the brakes were not reapplied sufficiently before the controls were isolated the second time, and as our driver strolled into the building, they began to release. The platform at Broadmeadows is on a 1 in 5000 gradient, almost but not quite level, and there was a gentle 16 km per hour breeze blowing towards the city. Movement would have begun very, very slowly, probably taking about a minute and a half to reach the end of the platform, which it passed at 9.18pm. The first indication that anything was wrong occurred when an intending passenger came into the station, knocked on the ticket window and complained that the train had departed early. The station master, presumably surprised by this, went onto the platform and asked the signaller what the deal was. The signaller didn't know why it had departed early. Heading back inside, the station master came face to face with the driver exiting the staff facilities. Sadly, history doesn't record what was said at this moment, but it must have been interesting. The driver immediately ran out onto the platform, where another intending passenger pointed in the direction of the city and said, It's over there. The driver raced to the end of the platform, jumped down onto the track, and began giving chase. Just 200 metres from the platform, the gradient increases sharply to 1 in 82, and the train was beginning to accelerate. As his train disappeared into the night, our driver called back to the signal box using a trackside telephone, sharing the alarming news that he had failed to get aboard. The signaller immediately called the suburban train control centre, METROL, not to be confused with METRO, which didn't exist yet. At the moment METROL was notified, the train had already been rolling for 4 minutes and 50 seconds. Now at this point, let's take a moment to add a bit more context. Firstly, let's take a look at the gradient diagram for the whole Broadmeadows line. So here's Broadie, our train is rolling along here, and this is the Glenroy Bank. Can you see the problem? There's about 2.8 kilometres of 1 in 50 descending down to Pasco Vale, 
followed by a short climb up through Strathmore and Glenbervie, and then it's downhill all the way to the city. Now, there are a couple of other things that would normally stop an out-of-control train. The driver's pilot valve, more commonly known as the dead man's handle, is designed to bring the train to a stop if the driver becomes unresponsive. However, that only works in an active cab. Because the driver had isolated the cab in 393M, but never made it to the front of the train to cut in 394M's cab, neither cab was active, so the dead man system was inoperative. This makes sense, of course, because it's normal for multiple units to have one or more inactive cabs in a moving train, so they need to be able to be isolated. Melbourne suburban trains are also fitted with a mechanical automatic train stop, which is a little trip valve that hangs down from the left-hand side of the leading bogey. Each signal has a corresponding arm, which raises up when the signal is at stop, and if a train passes the signal at stop, the arm will come into contact with the trip, applying the brakes. But again, same story, the trip arm is only lowered on active cabs. When the cab is isolated, it's folded up out the way. So without any of those features active, the train brake released, and with the park brake not applied, train 5264 was completely at the mercy of gravity. It's also worth noting that because the driver had not entered 394M's cab, it was leading the train through the night with no headlights. Just the two red marker lights would have been lit. The passenger doors, which had been open on the platform side of Broadmeadows, would have also still been open. For the majority of the line, except for a short section around North Melbourne, Metrol had no live way to track the position of trains, and with the majority of stations unstaffed, the only real way to track the runaway's progress was by remotely watching for it on platform CCTV cameras, which themselves were only visible to certain station staff, and not by Metrol directly. So back to our train, which has just passed through Jakarta and is approaching the top of the bank. At 9.24, it was seen passing through the platforms at Glenroy. Now up until this point, the train had actually been more or less behaving itself. The Broadmeadows signaller had set the route for its departure before it rolled away, so it was running through green signals and on the correct track towards the city. However, while passing through Glenroy, the train broke its first rule. The Glenroy Road level crossing is located just beyond the platforms, or at least it was at the time, that crossing is gone now. And as is standard practice for a location like this, when a train approaches which is supposed to stop at the station, the signal at the end of the platform stays red for an extended period, allowing the boom gates to lower as the train slows into the platform, which minimises delays to road traffic. Here's an example of that situation at Fairfield. The signal is red as we're pulling in, the crossing is only activating just now, and then the signal clears once the crossing is fully down. However, while gravity is an enthusiastic train driver, it doesn't know about red signals, and with the trip arm isolated, train 5264 sailed straight past the signal and through the crossing while the booms were still only halfway down. At this point, the folks at Metrol were just getting their heads around the situation, and there was one really big unknown. Nobody knew if any passengers had boarded the train at Broad Meadows. They certainly might have, it had been sitting in the platform with the doors open, and being 2003, mobile phones were still very uncommon, so the expectation would have been that if there were people on board, they would have no way of contacting the outside world. In reality, the train was empty. That passenger who complained at the Broad Meadows ticket office had actually just had the most fortunate missed train experience of their life. One way to stop a runaway train is to wreck it on purpose, send it into a siding or otherwise attempt to derail it. But with the real possibility there might be people on board, this was a situation best avoided, if at all possible. At 9.26, Metrol instructed the overhead power to be switched off between Glenroy and Newmarket. The report says this was an attempt to stop the train, however it's really not clear why they thought that would work. Maybe they thought there was a possibility the train was actually powering, but again, the report doesn't specify. Anyway, needless to say, gravity didn't care about the power being switched off, and the train was now rapidly accelerating down Glenroy Bank. There are several more level crossings on this section, which did have time to activate, but with significantly reduced warning time. Now the normal line speed limit here is 80 km per hour. Fortunately there aren't any particularly tight curves, and that speed is more to do with the spacing of signals, which the train was obviously ignoring anyway. There's a thing called the Position of Train System, or POTS, which records train data including speed at certain trackside locations. We don't have a speed measurement for the bottom of the hill at Pasca Vale, but based on other recordings nearby, it's estimated our train was doing about 120 k's an hour at this point. The gentle climb up to Essendon slowed it to about 75 k's an hour, where it screeched through the 50 k curve approaching the platform. By now it was clear the train wasn't stopping anytime soon, and Metrol had some serious decisions to make about where to send it as it rapidly approached the city. Broadly speaking, there were two main options. First would be to send it through the suburban platforms at Spencer Street, now called Southern Cross, either via the East Suburban or through Suburban lines through North Melbourne. This would have resulted in the train travelling at speed out the other side of Spencer Street and onto the viaduct towards Flinders Street Station, which is a very busy place with lots of trackage that's only suitable for low speeds. If it could be safely routed through Flinders Street, there might have been a real possibility of stopping the train naturally on one of the lines which climb gradually uphill to the east. However, it seems like this option wasn't given much thought, as safely routing the train through Flinders Street at high speed and at very short notice would have posed a major challenge. 
The other option was to send the runaway through North Melbourne on the East Suburban, but then divert it into the unelectrified dead-end country platforms at Spencer Street. This would be guaranteed to stop the train, but equally guaranteed a collision with either another train or the buffers. The decision was quickly made that sending it into Spencer Street was the least worst option, and at 9.26, Metro called Spencer Street number one box, which controlled the whole area approaching the country platforms, and that conversation went like this. Yeah? Who's this, Steve? Yeah. Yeah, mate, we got a uh, situation here. We got the runaway train, the uh, up train from Bordy. Yeah? It's already at Glen Burby going towards Essendon. Just wondering, th- are they suggesting that we go and bring it towards you? You're going to bring it towards me? Yep, number one box. Oh, really? And where am I going to put it? Uh, anywhere, anywhere that's safe for the train to stop. If that one, if that will come towards Spencer Street. I haven't got, I haven't got a platform to put it in. You got no platform to put it in? No. Nope. The only place I'll have is platform one when the Adelaide goes, and then it'll run down and hit the bottom anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. And it'll run out of wire, and then of course nothing moves. Hmm. Hmm. And that's what they want to do. Yeah, that's right. Righto. Okay? Yeah, no worries. No worries, see ya. Yeah, hey, listen. What we can see from this, and this is a common theme throughout the whole incident, is that nobody was really processing just how fast the train was moving, and the gravity of the situation wasn't being conveyed in conversation. The fact that number one box said they wouldn't have a free platform until the next scheduled departure misses the seemingly obvious option of moving one of the trains out the way before its departure time. In fact, at the time of this phone call, the runaway was still seven minutes away. Not long, but long enough to quickly kick everyone off a train and shunt it to the yard. Just after that call, at 9.27, the Essendon signaller reported seeing the train through Mooney Ponds on CCTV. This was just five and a half minutes after it had been sighted at Glenroy, seven and a half kilometres back. While all this was going on, another situation was unfolding. With the train travelling much faster than anyone's estimation, it was now rapidly catching up on another train, train 5262, the previous Upbroad Meadows service, with about 40 people on board, also formed by a three-car Comenge. 5262 had just left Kensington, and the decision was made to cancel its planned route onto the East Suburban, instead routing it onto the Main Suburban to get it out the way. The route was cancelled at 928, however, there's a system in place which prevents another route being set immediately, as this could obviously be dangerous if done right in front of a moving train. Once a route is cancelled, the points can't be changed for a new route for 90 seconds. So at 9.30pm, train 5262 was brought to a stand at the now red signal before the junction. At basically the same moment, just over a kilometre away, the Kensington signaller reported that the runaway had just passed through, going like a tyrant. Just as the 90 second timeout completed and 5262 received a signal to proceed onto the main suburban, the driver looked in his mirror and, alarmingly, saw the runaway flying around the curve towards the rear of his train, remembering it was dark and didn't have headlights, so it probably wasn't easy to spot. Needless to say, he began accelerating with some enthusiasm and flew through the 40k crossover at a little more than 60 km per hour. The interlocking at the junction wouldn't allow the points to be changed back to the straight direction until 5262 had vacated the relevant track circuit, and the runaway was now right behind it and closing fast. The instant 5262 was clear, the Metrol signaller changed the points back to the east line, and for a nail-biting moment, the signal panel appeared to show that the trains had in fact collided. Metrol couldn't immediately get a response from the driver of 5262 and feared the worst. However, the driver then returned to the radio, saying the runaway was passing his train through North Melbourne at speed. Only 33 seconds had elapsed between 5262 moving off from the signal and 5264 passing it, and later analysis shows the points had been changed with less than one second to spare. Meanwhile, over at Spencer Street, with the runaway moving at about 80 km per hour and less than 2 km away, number one box still didn't really know what they were in for, and communication from Metrol had been absent while they were dealing with the near miss at North Melbourne. All the country platforms were still occupied, and number one box had set a couple of routes for upcoming departures. The Overland was on Platform 1, due to depart for Adelaide at 9.40. Platform 2 held the 9.35 Bacchus Marsh. 3 had a locomotive hold set stapled ready to form a Kyneton train the next morning. 4 had a Sprinter on the 9.35 Geelong. 5 had another stapled locomotive hold set. 6 had a Sprinter for the 9.40 Kyneton. And 7 had an empty set of passenger cars, waiting for the following morning's Warnable train. There were also several empty tracks in between the platforms, however, using one of these would have resulted in a high-speed collision with the buffers, and would still be very destructive. At 9.31, Metrol calls number one box and informs them that train 5264 is now very close and travelling at speed. The signaller has barely received this message and is still on the phone as the train comes into view. I've got him, I see him, f***ing he's coming up hard. 
The signaller had only just cancelled the routes for departing trains in order to set a new route for the runaway, but there was no time for the 90-second points rundown to complete, so no new route could be set. The report doesn't state what other route the signaller actually planned on setting at this moment anyway. So, with the departing routes cancelled but all points still in the positions they'd been previously set for, 5264 forced its way through a trailing set of points and claimed the route formally set for train 8141, the 935 train to Bacchus Marsh, which was sitting in platform 2. 8141 was formed by a diesel electric locomotive N463 City of Bendigo on a four car set of H type passenger cars. With its departure time just over two minutes away, the driver was in the cab along with another employee, and 16 passengers were on board, all in the first two cars. The conductor was still on the platform. Now what you might be starting to guess here is that, alarmingly, nobody had yet raised the alarm at Spencer Street. Nobody on the trains or platforms knew anything about the runaway. With just 45 seconds to go, Metrol called, apparently the only person they could get hold of, a Connex employee all the way over on platforms 9 and 10. While taking the call, this employee saw an empty train slowly rolling into platform 14, and thought that must be the train in question, so didn't make any effort to contact the country platforms. Then, they heard what can only be described as a very loud bang from somewhere behind them. The driver and second person in the cab of 8141 had no prior warning before seeing the alarming sight of an electric suburban train hurtling at speed through the unelectrified Spencer Street Yard coming straight at them. They leapt clear with seconds to spare. Somebody shouted to the passengers to watch out, and at 9.33, Train 5264 ploughed into 8141 at about 75 kilometres per hour. Fortunately, it turns out that 257 tonnes worth of N-Class and H-Set make a very effective buffer, and were pushed back just 22 metres before bringing the runaway to a halt. One passenger on board was quoted as saying, It just blacked out, and everything went black, and things were thrown everywhere, suggesting that the auxiliary power from the loco used for lighting was interrupted immediately. Emergency services were quickly on the scene, having been alerted before the time of impact, and it was only now that staff on the ground were able to finally confirm that train 5264 was in fact completely empty. Despite the no doubt violent forces experienced on board the passenger cars, only 8 of the 16 passengers were injured. Four required hospitalisation, but none of the injuries were life-threatening. The train had covered the 16.8 kilometres from Broadmeadows in just 16 minutes, a trip which takes a normal express train 21 minutes. Taking into account the initial delay in reporting the runaway, Metrol was only aware of the situation 11 minutes before impact, which is less time than you've already spent watching this video. Needless to say, both trains were extensively damaged. 394M's cab was completely crushed, compacting back to the first passenger doorway. In this view, you can clearly see the original 1980s fiberglass front, which had been concealed under the new front added by EDI during refurbishment. Its pantograph was also damaged, having fully extended when coming off the overhead and then colliding with several objects on approach to the platforms. 393M's pantograph avoided this, as it had automatically lowered when the overhead power had been switched off earlier, a safety feature which reduces load if power returns after a brief unexpected outage. Trailer car 1048T derailed and became fully separated from 394M. N463 fared a lot better. It was lifted off its leading bogey, and while there was some pretty severe damage, the overall structure of the cab remained intact. There was some damage to the H set, including the floor in the leading car being forced up by the coupling bar. It wasn't known for sure that the train hadn't hit anything, or anyone, along the route, and at about 10pm a police helicopter flew the length of the line to check for casualties with its thermal imaging camera. However, nothing was found, and trains were allowed to cautiously commence running again shortly after. The ATSB report was completed six months later and produced a long list of findings. The root cause of the runaway was the driver's failure to follow correct procedure when isolating the controls of 393M for the second time at Broadmeadows. However, it was also found that the procedures themselves were laid out across three separate documents with some inconsistencies, that different drivers often did things different ways, and that the park brake was not required to be applied under certain circumstances. The lack of real-time monitoring over most of the route, combined with the train's large exceedance of the line speed, made it very difficult to predict its position, and most people involved dramatically underestimated how quickly it was moving. The near miss with train 5262 occupied the attention of all involved during a critical time which prevented better warning being given to Spencer Street number one box. Number one box didn't really know how serious the situation was until the train was almost upon them, and during that brief window of time they did not give any warning to the drivers of the trains awaiting departure from Spencer Street. The lack of ability for Metrol to quickly get a warning to a well-placed staff member at Spencer Street was a huge failure. The possibility that there might have been passengers on board the runaway influenced the decision making, ruling out some more extreme options like attempting to derail the train. So, with 20 years to think about it rather than 11 minutes, what could have been done better? Well, 
I thought about a lot of different ways this could have ended, and most of them end up a lot worse than what actually happened. Sending it into another train at Spencer Street arguably had a better outcome than sending it into an empty platform, where the car body probably would have separated from the bogies and gone over the top of the buffers, potentially causing significantly more damage. If enough warning had been given to number one box, they could have issued a warning over radio channel one, which would have been heard by all train crews in the platforms who could have then evacuated their trains. Another option would have been to send it into a siding, but there are actually very few choices here. You can't access the Kensington Mill siding from the upline, which basically leaves the North Melbourne Arrivals Yard area, but the odds of a very messy derailment would have been high. The train also could have been sent into the city loop, but this would have been extremely risky and there was other traffic in the area at the time. As for the near miss with 5262, if it had been known just how fast the runaway was approaching, I don't think they would have cancelled 5262's original route on the east suburban to divert it onto the main suburban. This wasted a lot of time while it waited at the signal for a new route, and in hindsight it would have been much better to let it run straight into North Melbourne on the east lines, then set a route for the runaway via the main, and you can still get through to the Spencer Street country platforms from there. There may have been some concern about sending it through this crossover at high speed, but the reality is that it passed through several similarly tight curves on the approach to Spencer Street anyway, including this wiggle at the up end of North Melbourne. But all in all, there were really no good outcomes possible, and going for a harm minimisation approach was really all they could do. So, what happened to the two trains involved? Well, commentators at the time took one look at the pictures and very reasonably predicted that 394M would never run again. However, they were wrong. Quite remarkably, both 394M and N463 were repaired and returned to service. 394M, along with the rest of its set, went on to spend another 18 years carrying passengers around Melbourne, before being withdrawn in June 2022 and scrapped not long after, as part of the general end-of-life retirement for the Comenge fleet. During this time, there was almost no evidence of the damage it had sustained on that fateful night, except for a very slight battle scar where the cab had been rebuilt. Apparently this was done using a supply of spare stainless steel provided by Comenge when these trains were built in the 80s. N463 returned to service and is still hauling passenger trains around regional Victoria to this day. Although locomotive hauled trains will be phased out in the next few years, it's very likely that it will then move on to a new career with a freight operator. In some of my photos of N463, there are some slight body defects which might date from the accident, but also could be from something else given this loco's long life hammering up and down Victoria's main lines. As a final note, while the Broadmeadows runaway was the longest and highest speed runaway ever achieved by a Melbourne suburban train, it certainly wasn't the only one. In 1975, a two-car Tate set rolled from Camberwell to Flinders Street. In 1977, a Harris set rolled from Gowrie to Jewell. And in 1996, a Hitachi rolled away from Flinders Street, although that one only made it about 200 metres. All of these happened for similar reasons relating to the procedures for applying brakes when leaving the cab, so while the Brody runaway may not have been completely inevitable, it was hardly unprecedented. After this incident, the policy was changed to say that parking brakes must be applied whenever the driver leaves the cab for any reason, so it's pretty unlikely this will ever happen again, fingers crossed. And at least if it does, Southern Cross now has these enormous bouncy buffers. As a final final note, it's also worth mentioning that the Broadmeadows runaway happened just four days after the waterfall derailment in New South Wales, where the driver of an interurban Tangara train passed away at the controls, the dead man's handle failed to operate, and the train derailed through a curve, resulting in six additional deaths and 40 injuries. So, that was the story of the Broadmeadows Runaway. This video does not attempt to cover every single aspect of what happened. If you would like more detail, you can read the 76 page report linked to in the video description. Always remember to apply your park brakes, and thanks for watching.